And good morning. This is Art Waves, and I'm your host, Michael Shields, here for the Conk Broadcasting Network. My very special guest today is Yuyutsu Sharma, who is going to be giving us a preview of his presentation tonight at the UU. That's the Universalist Unitarian or Unitarian Universalist. Either way, hmm. it's going to be a grand time and a remarkable opportunity for you to hear and to meet Yuyu. So I want to welcome you. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Namaste. Is this your first trip to Key West? Yes, this is. Wow. First one. Well, this is a pleasure then and a treat to have you here. You have been the recipient of many accolades and awards and recognition for your work of poetry. You're also a noted translator and have been uh, notably uh, the recipient of a Rockefeller Grant and others to uh, pursue and develop your work. And being from Nepal, I think it's important to understand the journey that you have made as an artist, as a poet, all the way from Nepal to the southernmost city in the United States. And you have traveled the entire world. Yeah. So this is a first trip to Key West. But can you give us a little background, of course, on uh, your homeland and the, your education and how you discovered the gift of poetry? Well, uh, to talking about this visit to Key West, uh, I think uh, uh, I'm reminded of Walt Whitman who said, uh, I am planting friendships thick as tree trunks along the river Mississippi. <laughs> I think uh, thanks to my friend Susan Kaiser who, and, uh, who invited me over uh, and think uh, this is without uh, uh, Susan's uh, initiative I would not be here. Uh, I think this is what I do. We have been all over, uh, I've been all over. I mean this is how you meet people and uh, you come to, this, to, to different parts of the world. Uh, I, I am working at, at NYU. I'm the uh, visiting poet at uh, this spring for the NYU, and I had a reading there, and I'm, 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 I did some teaching, and uh, so, and I'm, uh, and then I've been traveling all over the United States and to read uh, uh, from my books. So, uh, but I'm very glad to be here at Key West because uh, this reminds me of the Himalayas, the foothills, and there's a small town called Pokhara, uh, which is a lake town. Uh, and my, most of my work is about the lake town and about the Annapurna, the ranges that are above that, uh, that, uh, that uh, lake. So uh, I'm very enthralled and very excited uh, of being here, walking in the streets of Key West. I felt so much at home and I was telling Suzanne how, how it's so, so very wonderful uh, to feel that energy uh, which is so positive and which is so vital. You mentioned, of course, that the Himalayas are, of course, our planet's most grandest of mountains, the highest elevations, and the lakeside, that's fresh water that comes off of the mountain. True. We are an island surrounded by salt water. Yeah. What is the distinction that comes to you between the fresh and the salt water? Oh, well, uh, I mean, this is uh, what I see is that uh, Annapurna. Uh, the Everest of the region, the Himalayas, is uh, uh, more, uh, the, the lake is formed from the glaciers that melt and uh, they form. Uh, and there's a sea. So I see the, the wilderness of the sea compared with the Himalayas, which is uh, as, as ferocious and as, uh, uh, you know, uh, encompassing and as vital. So this, this wilderness of the sea is compared to the wilderness of the, of the Himalayas. So I see a perfect uh, place similar to, to Nepal, uh, which is uh, that I am at the foothills of the Himalayas and I am at the foothills of the sea. Uh, so this is kind of uh, a strange uh, comparison. I was there for a brief uh, uh, supper last night at, on the beach. Uh, I mean, uh, the whole, uh, also the people, how they behave, and you know, the the, the, the tourist kind of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the place and the the, the, mm -hmm. the whole the whole tourist range. So it's it's very 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 exciting, and I'm feeling much at home here. Well, we certainly are an embracing culture, because of the nature of an island. We're always looking outward to see who is arriving. And our culture is a polyglot of many cultures, and despite our diminutive scale, a mere two by four miles, uh, very densely populated, but in fact the population has not changed in almost 100 years. We've had about the same number of people with some ups and downs, but basically the same population level. Now it has spread out a little bit because we've built out most of the island, with uh, some exceptions, around the salt ponds. 
in the Himalayas. Was this the scale of the mountains gives you a view of the world, or does the world give you a view of the mountains? Well, uh, you know, Nepal was closed uh, till 50s, 1950s, yeah. and there was uh, nobody could come there because there were despot rulers who wouldn't let anybody come in, or even people weren't allowed to be educated. So, uh, and then it opened up. So, and with the tourism, with the hippies coming there, and, and all, the, all the modern world entering and ushering into the uh, traditional value system, uh, with, with the tourism uh, bringing, you know, new energy to the life, education, and also a lot of Nepalese uh, soldiers, you know, the Gurkhas, they go to go to get recruited in, in the British in, Army or Indian Army. Indian, yeah. And that helped, uh, and that also, the, uh, the, the good part of that is that they came back and they brought education and they spread uh, the whole knowledge of the other world. So in a way, this, uh, this uh, the mountain uh, is similar to, to, to Key West, I see that. Uh, Nepal was also closed and then now we have the whole, and whole world coming up there because the world's highest mountain is there. And so I, I, I see a lot of comparison here, and this is uh, very exciting. But but this is again I was talk, talking to Susan, and uh, I was thinking how, and Alex how how this thing uh, it can be dangerous also to 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 wipe out that centuries old traditions and cultures, especially in Nepal where people have lived for centuries without any outside uh, invasion. But now with the senseless modernization and tourism, it it can erode the value system. So it uh, the tourism. Uh, has to be arranged and managed uh, meaningfully so that it does not erode the entire entire system. So tourism without any control uh, is is a dangerous proposition. So I would I would rather see it uh, as a, as a boon, but then it has to be uh, dealt with very carefully. Well, you've certainly touched on a number of salient issues that affect us in this tourist town uh, that has a rich culture of. of of uh, many uh, nationalities and, and lands. But uh, the West, of course, having been invaded basically by the Europeans and then settled, and now our entire planet has been, if not invaded, has been infused with a mix of all kinds of people that bring us uh, all manner of awareness. And I think to the average individual, Nepal, and the Himalayas, of course, hold a very, very special place because of its uniqueness, obviously, but also because of this almost mysterious and hidden culture for which, through the words and ideas of a poet such as yourself, we're able to examine it more authentically than just simply through a postcard or some visuals, mm -hmm. some images. So when you address your audiences from all through this country and internationally. Do you find a common curiosity or is there something different about some people that they're more interested in different aspects of life in Nepal? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the first thing that uh, strikes them, like most of, peop most of the people don't know where Nepal is, you know. Some, it's out you know, there. <laughs> they think, yeah, some thought it's in Latin America, you know. <laughs> and and right. so I have to for, uh, introduce my world and uh, say this is the top of the world is there, Everest is there. Yeah. And Everest again is a, is a is a not a, a Nepali name. Nepali name for Everest is uh, Sagarmatha, which is, uh, uh, is a, Everest is a British name. And during colonial rule, then they tried to discover if, uh, if Everest is the highest mountain in the world. Uh, they named it after the guy who was the chief at that time. Mm -hmm. So the Nepali name is Sagarmatha, which is which means uh, uh, forehead of the sky. Forehead of the sky. Which is very poetic. Mm -hmm. And Tibetan name for uh, Himalayas is. Uh, is uh, Chomolungma, which means the mother of the winds of the world. Chumalunga? Chomolungma. Okay. Which means mother of the winds of the world, which is again very poetic. So, uh, and also, uh, you know, it's very exotic in a way that uh, it's, it's, it has been untouched and it has uh, not uh, been uh, ever there. I mean, it's there, you know, the whole existentialist issue, yeah, yeah. because it's there. Yeah. So, and that's why we wanted to explore it. Yeah. Well, we're going to continue our conversation with Yuyutsu Sharma, poet, translator, magician of words. Tonight, in a preview today, I have a presentation at the UU Church. Uh, stay tuned for more here on Kunk. Are you ready for a change? I'm Adair Fritz. As a certified personal trainer, I assist individuals in creating a new vision of their lives. I use a gentle and kind approach 
towards an improved new outlook of life and living. Whether you want to be toned and trim or fit and agile, I can show you the way. I also specialize in restoring balance and mobility to victims of Parkinson's and accidents. Call me, Adair Fritz, at 305-394-4895. That's 305-394-4895 to get you started on a new path, a path towards vibrant, healthy living. Back with Art Waves. I'm your host, Michael Shields, here on the Conk Broadcasting Network. Our studios at 402 Apple Ruth Lane, here in the heart of Old Town Key West. The Royal Poinciannas are blooming. I think somewhat early this year. Usually, I don't seem to seem to notice them until June or certainly July when they're in full blaze. But this past couple of weeks, they have erupted, and the sky is ablaze. The flowers, the frangipanis. The Roy Poncianas, the array of tropical color and fragrances that infuse our environment do lend itself to the poet within all of us, I think, because we are altered, we are touched, we, are, we breathe in. Some people have said that poetry really is about the breath the inner breath that keeps us alive. Is that an apt description of poetry to your mind, that, that poetry informs us of our natural world? Or is it purely intellectual? Uh, well, uh, in, in India, Nepal, uh, in the whole, whole subcontinent, we have this great uh, oral tradition. You know, our, uh, we, are the, uh, we have the centuries-old uh, tradition of uh, writing poetry. In fact, uh, all of our scriptures were in poems. Uh, so we had the oral traditions before. Uh, so p- people will chant the mantra, and they will rem- remember them by heart. And mantra is a is a breath unit. You're talking of breathing. So uh, 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 like mantra would be one breath unit. So if you uh, that's why it it will connect you to the cosmos, and it will less yoga and everything is about man- about breathing. So uh, so uh, they they would have to decide. That's why they have a healing impact. You know, so I would like, let's say, I recite mantra Om Bhur Vaya Swaya Tata Savitra Bhari Niyam Bhargo Divasya Diyo Yon Parcho Diyat. So I, I said this in one breath. <laughs> so the, the length of this is one breath. One breath, yeah. So be, because of the breath, and, and, and like Allen Ginsberg tried to imitate it and write yeah. poems uh, uh, yeah. of one breath in, with the harmonium. Uh, so he picked it up and, and tried to work on it. So the, uh, the whole idea of uh, breathing uh, and uh, the, uh, the chanting and the mantras, uh, and and they, they, they never wrote those poems, so the, 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 the disciples will remember them by heart and they will pass on to the mm. next generation. Mm. So the rich, rich poetry tradition, and there was no authorship, so to say. Mm. So they will say, says Kabir or says Vyasa. So peop, the, the pandits mm. and the priests mm. would come and write the verses and memorize them and, and add someone's name, a, an anonymous name or someone's name. Mm. So you didn't matter, the, the breath mattered, the, the breathing mattered. And also I was talking uh, to Suzanne that how uh, Himalayas, uh, the Sanskrit name for the Himalayas is uh, Devatatma, which in, which, uh, in literary, literal translation would mean a place where soul of the God lives. Mm. So, uh, you, and also a lot of breathing uh, when you go up, you know, it's, it's, you need a lot of stamina and, and also the, the whole, whole idea of, of being in touch with the soul of the God. So uh, there's a real sacred relationship as well as profane that speaks not simply to an abstraction, but is part of our understanding of where we are in the world. I'm reminded, just backing up just slightly, about the tourist world, or the world of being a tourist. Huxley, Aldous, said at one time, there's a distinction between the traveler and the tourist. And the traveler looks to see what is out there. The tourist wants to already know before he goes. Like, okay, yeah. what, what am I supposed to see? Uh, it's in the guidebook, so I, I better find that. Yeah. Whereas the traveler is much more of an explorer, a little yeah. more intrepid. 
in your writings, as a traveler, exploring this world, what is it that you try to see? Well, uh, is, that uh, a, is that a fair question? Yeah, this is a very beautiful question. And, uh, because the travel motif is central to my work and to the works of my continent. Uh, because uh, like Buddha or, or Krishna or Rama, uh, in, in old times, uh, the Himalayas is a place known for uh, all the sages when you, when you have to seek parents to come out and, and explore. So travel within yourself mm -hmm. and, or, or within, or, or out of yourself. You know, the journey within and outside. So you would come to the Himalayas. In, in the Mahabharata, the great epic, there's a war between two, two clans. And when everybody's finished, they go up to the Himalayas and uh, to seek penance. Mm. And one, one by one, they die. <laughs> so th th this has been like a great, great place to, to the journey motif is, is very crucial and very central to, uh, to, to the Himalayan lore and Himalayan legends. And also we have, like you have Hemingway, we have Yeti. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I see I saw a lot of uh, parallels in, in Key West in Himalayas, and yeah. this is just so, so very exciting. Well, of course, mentioning uh, Hemingway is uh, the most noted uh, author, uh, a former resident, and his tour of duty almost here <laughs> was by accident. He was on his way elsewhere. Oh, yeah. He didn't intend to stay here, he just wanted to stop and was awaiting the delivery of a car. And while he was waiting for this car, another vehicle, to take him still somewhere else, well, he fell in love with the island. Recently, in this week's Solaris Hill, A.B. Malloy, who's the uh, director of, the, uh, 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 of a social agency here, Guidance Care, uh, Clinic, uh, had a very beautiful uh, piece that she wrote about I fell in love again and again and again, basically. And the tale closely mirrors that of Hemingway, of everyone who has come to the Keys at some point, at some level, where she fell in love and then had to leave. Fell in love and came back because she couldn't stay away. She had to keep coming back. She had to keep coming back. And that's a story that I hear repeated often. Uh, we find a place that nourishes us, and then we reach a point where you go, ah, I have to get out of here, I gotta go, I can't stay here any longer. Mm -hmm. For whatever the reasons, economic, social, um, relationships of all kinds. And so this island seems to attract people who are seeking something beyond just simply a holiday. Uh, that we take to a place that might give us a different view of the world. And yet, you, when you write in your books and in your, through your uh, readings, you take us to another world that is similar, I feel, that you fall in love with it, then you have to get away. You, then you come back to it and you have to get away. Uh, is that the cycle? Is there a cyclic nature to your, to your work that you feel speaks to yeah. this. It, it talks very uh, importantly about my journey as a writer. When I was, I used to teach at university before and uh, at, at Kathmandu uh, University. So there, uh, I got uh, tired of it after a while and I thought because uh, when you teach students, you know, you get, you pay a lot of attention and you, and you spend a lot of your energy. And, and that same energy you would, you would use in writing your own work. So I, at one stage I thought I would quit and I, 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 I resigned. And I went to this lakeside town I started traveling, and then I, I this boy somehow there, they sent, oh, go, go over, have a small trek. And I, I went into the Himalayas for the first time, about 15 years ago, and I was so dazed, and so very mesmerized by mm. their beauty and by the whole thing, that I have, I've been going there every year, and it, I made them my home. Uh, so this, the, 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 this travel image, and this, this, the Himalayas has given me new breath and new life. And uh, so this, this is very important that they, they nourish me, they nourish my, my life, my, 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 my poetic world. And, uh, and I spread, and, and with their flavor, I have got wings now. Mm -hmm. I am flying all over the world <laughs> uh, with the message from the Himalayas. You know, in Buddhist scriptures, you have these flags with the yeah. prayer mantras inscribed on them. The whole idea is that the mantras will, the winds of the world will come and spread the the word mm -hmm. of the mantras all mm -hmm. over the world. Mm -hmm. So this, this, this spirit of, in the spirit of that, that very spiritual flag, I think Himalayas has given my, my poems, my world, uh, this energy and vitality that I can now fly all over the world and talk about them. 
so my, my big, uh, big namaste to these uh, powerful mountains, uh, this great world that uh, nourishes me and they where the soul of the God lives. Well, we're going to continue this traveling with my guest, Yuyutsu Sharma, uh, who tonight will be giving a presentation and readings at the Unitarian Universalist Church at 7 o'clock. That's at the corner of Georgia and Petronia. So stay tuned for more here on the Conk Broadcasting Network. Medic! Has your website blown up? Need updating or tweaking? Forget expensive web design firms. Call on your web medic. Like a personal MD or a master mechanic, the medic can do just the job you need, but on a budget. Find out more at yourwebmedic.com or call 888-YW-MEDIC. That's 888-996-3342. Hello, I'm Corey Held, Realtor with Preferred Properties in Key West. If you're a buyer or a seller and are wondering what direction to take in this ever-challenging real estate market, you'll want my professional opinion. I have been consistently in the top 1% of realtors in the Keys. Contact me at 305-240-0355 or visit my website at www.coryheldrealtor.com. And we are back. I'm your host, Michael Shields, for Art Waves here in the Conk Broadcasting Network. My guest this morning, Yuyutsu Sharma, giving a presentation and readings tonight to the Unitarian Universalist Church at Georgia and Petronia Street at 7 o'clock. It's free. Uh, you are all welcome and invited to bring your friends for a most remarkable opportunity to uh, meet Yuyu. And uh, this morning we've been traveling, uh, traveling from afar and traveling from near. And the, the ideas of flight and inner journeys, I think, are at the heart of many poets uh, to give us a, a window into the world for which we are not privy to uh, on our normal, quote, normal days. And yet when we take time to pause and take time to, re to really be in the natural world, such as Thoreau pointed out, if you want to know your mind, look to the sky. And here in your native land, Nepal, where the Himalayas are the ever-present reminder of our place in the world, where has that given you access, I say, to worlds that you would not have seen otherwise? Yeah, I, I think uh, the question has to go back. I was born in Punjab in India, and uh, my father was from mountains, so my mother was from lowlands. And uh, since childhood, uh, I had this, I would go to meet my father, and I, I had this uh, tremendous desire to see and uh, live in the mountains. And then I was, uh, after a while, I, I moved over to the mountains. Uh, but uh, mountains are the places where you have you know, elevation and you go, you, you, you rise above. In, in, in Sanskrit and all these scriptures we have, Parnassus, you know. Uh, so uh, mountains are higher, higher levels of consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they, in, they give you uh, also, that's why sages would go and stay in the mountains. And uh, so this, this, and also when I was very small, I had this very big uh, uh, religious atmosphere in my family. My father was under the awe of these Naga, sadhus, ascetics, mm -hmm. you know, those who put ash over their body and have mm -hmm. dreadlocks and, you know, and they, they, the whole idea is to torture the body mm -hmm. yeah, because body is evil. Mm -hmm. it, it desires, it lusts, it mm -hmm. seeks, mm -hmm. and whereas uh, jewel is the soul and soul is an obstacle to mm -hmm. attain soul. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, this whole, and at one point uh, in, in my life, he almost donated me to the, one of the holy priests, said, take this boy, it's yours. Uh, luckily, this uh, priest was very smart, and he said, "Well, no, this, this is a good boy. Send him to school. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. I would be somewhere in the Himalayan cave doing uh, the sadhana or these meditations." Uh -huh. 
And uh, that would have almost altogether changed my life. Yeah. So I, I'm thankful to this holy man who, who sort of uh, thought of this and sent me uh, racing in the world uh, to, uh, to attain other parts of the, to other, other, other journeys and other spiritual enlightenments. Uh, so this, uh, my life has been kind of en enmeshed in, in these kind of struggles too, and also the quirks of fate that, uh, that, that happened. And uh, so, uh, when I go to Himalayas, it's all of a sudden I feel like fish in the water. You know, it's mm -hmm. like you you have you get your element, and uh, so sa sages would go over uh, mm -hmm. and the, all the scriptures, and even the Sanskrit poets would go to the Himalayas and write there. Mm -hmm. So Himalayas is a great place for meditation, and uh, so that that's how it works. Well, I also wanted our listeners to know uh, a little bit more about you. Uh, of course, uh, I pointed out at the introduction to the program this morning. Uh, you're a recipient of Rockefeller uh, Foundation grant, but you also have nine books of, of poetry that you've published. Um, and, uh, incredibly, uh, as I read some part of your, your works here, um, a 900-page book with renowned German photographer Andreas Stimm, Space Cake, Amsterdam, and other poems from Europe and America. This is from the Howling Dog Press in Colorado. And the Annapurna poems in 2008 and reprinted uh, this year as well. Um, you have also brought out a translation of the Irish poet Cathal of Sirgai. Did I pronounce that right? Cathal Oshaki, yeah. Cathal Oshaki is Irish. He's an Irish poet. He okay. writes in Gaelic. So. Gaelic, okay. Yeah, I didn't yeah, get the Gaelic yeah, pronunciation yeah. correct. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, so. And I'm an Irishman. You know, oh, you are? Oh, Irish great. Shields, yeah. of course. Yeah. In fact, my ancestors, I'm told, uh, were the first poets to the kings of uh, Ireland. Oh. I don't know how true that is. Oh. I could have just made that up. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but this is in Nepali in a bilingual collection entitled Kathmandu, Poems Selected and New, and a translation of the Hebrew poet Rani Somex, Poetry in Nepali in a bilingual edition. And you've translated and edited several anthologies of contemporary Nepali poetry in English, launched a literary movement, Katya Kaya Kalpa, Kataka, yes, right. uh, which means content metamorphosis in Nepali poetry. Uh, two books of poetry uh, have just appeared in French and Spanish, respectively. Your work has been uh, read and uh, at several prestigious places, including the Poetry Cafe in London, the Seamus Haney Center for Poetry in Belfast, at NYU uh, in New York, of course, the Kring in Amsterdam, Penn in Paris, Knox College in Illinois, Whittier College in, and the Yates Center in Sligo, uh, the Gustav Stressman Institute in Bonn, and it's just all over the world. You have been able to uh, have audiences in many tongues, in many ears, in many ways of embracing your work that you have a universal language, which is a, a gift and a, and a real a treat for audiences, that you can speak to them in, a lang in their language, that even uh, uh, transcends the limits of our understandings. Um, now, you did bring some of your readings, and, and I hope that uh, you will uh, uh, gift us with uh, a selection of your choosing. Sure. Uh, uh, we would. I would love to hear some. Oh sure. Uh, I would especially like to mention uh, this big uh, picture book uh, that I do with the German photographer Andrea Stim. I uh, say it's, it's a great book. It's, it's, it centers on three volumes uh, and three volumes on three different regions of uh, Himalayas: Everest, Helambu, and Annapurna. And I met this poet at uh, when I was signing books in Frankfurt Book Fair. It's the biggest book fair in the world. Yeah. And uh, I, this guy came up to me and said, uh, I would like to read, uh, he bought a book and I uh, signed the book. And then afterward he said, I would like to use this um, for my photo exhibition. Mm -hmm. He goes to Nepal very often. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, okay. And then after a year, he brought this book out. Mm -hmm. And I was so surprised that uh, I hadn't expected this big picture book <laughs> to come with my poems. And it's a bilingual book in German and English. And uh, over the years, he has been, uh, we have been working together on these different regions. And we have brought these uh, books out. And uh, so th this has been a great uh, boon for me because I could travel with this very expensive book. And I get a lot of royalties and also with book signing. Uh, so the German publisher has been very instrumental in, in getting me uh, my travels. And, you know, uh, so this, and, and then they are Spanish. And, and uh, the Spanish book came from Cordoba and, uh, and from Paris. So th this has been uh, going on in uh, Slovenia and other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, yeah, of course, like to read. Uh, like we have been talking about breathing, and uh, the, I will read this poem, uh, which has uh, 
reference to uh, Devatatma, the, the soul of the God. A poem is called Little Paradise Lodge, and uh, this uh, is my favorite poem. Little it, Paradise Lodge? Yeah. Little Paradise Lost. Lodge. Okay. Lodge. 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 Yeah. Little Paradise Lodge. My pen frozen against the daggers of Annapurnas. On an oblong, shapeless plank, chopped from a sandalwood tree trunk and used as a table, I place my elbows and hold my face in my hands. Blinding snows of the Annapurna ridge, mutually shining in the eye of my mind. I sit in the spacious courtyard of your little paradise lodge, deciphering shrill notes of birds in the mossy trees. One bird initiates a lilting note like our meeting, while others let loose a racket of breath vessels ending with question tags. Can I stay longer, at least one more day, in your little paradise lodge? Two birds playing in the crimson cherry tree steal a chord that seems like opening up of the blossoms of our bodies. Would you take me away and marry me? But what about this electric whistle, this cicada's constant cheer, cheer, cheer? The, the struggle of our breathless bodies against the dark suit of the night, the pigeons strutting freely in your courtyard cool like exhausted porters, climbing the mule paths in the singing gorges, their guttural quint quint qua, quint quint qua, quint quint qua. They seem to be using a human language, a kind of hushed speech robbers might use. Love, in the courtyard of your little paradise lodge, I see silence turning flowers into daggers. A herd of cows shuffles past me in a joyous mood, festive like young girls going to a hillside fair, saying, don't you go away, brother, don't you go away, we would be back until dusk with presents. A cuckoo passes overhead, its distinct ka, 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 please. Please do not leave me alone. I am utterly alone, struck on the last mountain of the world. And beyond me, just one more mountain, where they say a deity lives, guarding a tiny Turkish lake. And thereafter, nothing but realm of melting snows, where souls of the gods live. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's just transformative. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. This is a small lodge near, you know, up in the mountain when you go track. And then I, it was, I discovered it through some friend. And then we went up there and I, I slept. And in the morning I woke up to see this huge uh, paradise so far, yeah. snow behind me. Yeah. And it was so exciting. Yeah. So it's, it's very, very dramatic. The mountains are yeah. so dramatic and so very, you know, it's, it's not like I was in Alps recently. I mean, I mean uh, other mountains look very small and kind of uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> compared to the Himalayas. Yeah, they just don't hold up. <laughs> Uh, because this is so very dramatic and everything is so, uh, so wild. People die there. I mean, they're yeah. tigers and they're, you know, yeah. they're, yeah. they're, they're landslides and they're, 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 it's, it's so very, very different. So, so much wilderness there. Mm -hmm. So, which makes it more, more fearsome. And uh, so this way, yeah. Very good. Shall I read? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, please. Uh, I would like another? to read this yes. poem, which is, uh, talks about uh, my world and especially because we, there are no road in the, roads in the mountains. And we don't have you know, the mules to carry the load and the porters who carry the load. Uh, so uh, this poem about the suffering of those people who live there, who mm. are trapped there in, in the, in the mm. great Himalayan... Uh, in servitude in, to, in, the yeah, mountain. to the mountains. Yeah, yeah. And as the tourists go, the new world is going and entering. So this is about that. It's called Mules. Mules. On the great Tibetan salt route, they meet me again, old forsaken friends. On their faces, fatigue of a drunken sleep. Their lives worn out, their legs twisted, shaking from carrying lustrous flags of bleeding ascents. Age-long bells clinging to them like festering wounds, beating notes of a slavery that modernism brings. Cartoons of iceberg, mineral water bottles, solar heaters, Chinese tiles, tin cans, carom boards, sacks of rice, and iodized salt from the plains of Nepal Tarai. Butterflies of the terrace fields know their names, singing brooks, tempests of their breathless climbs. Traffic alert and time tested, they climb, carrying dreams of posh peacocks, pamphlets of a secret religious war, filth of an ecologist trial semen, entire kitchen for a cocktail party at the base camp. Defunct development agendas of guilty donors, the West's weird visions lusting for an instant purge. 
Stone steps of the mountains, embossed on their drugged brains, like lines of a boated love, scratched on the historic rooks of the water spouts. Starry skies of the dozing valleys know the ache of their secret sweat. Sunny days along the crystal rivers taste of their bleeding eyes. And the greatest fiction of their struggling lives lost, like real mules clattering their hooves on the flagstones, encircling the cruel grandeur of bloodthirsty mule paths around the glaciers of Annapurnas. Oh. Boy, that is an interesting contrast of the power of the mountain and man's almost futile attempts to prevail against the might of that mountain. Uh, of course, the imagery is, is so rich. Who are the mules? You know, what are the mules? What are we carrying? What, what is it? the labors that we put on our own backs and our own souls? Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is great. Oh, this is great. Folks, you've got to come tonight. I'm telling yeah. you, 7 o'clock. Unitarian Universalist Church, 7 o'clock again, uh, 7 p.m. Georgia and uh, Petronia Streets. Um, let me shift a, a little bit here by asking you then, uh, as you travel, and uh, you, this is your first uh, journey to Key West, I dare say it will not be your last. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, because behind the walls of all of the homes in this lovely island. Whenever you cited your poem, The Paradise Lodge, many times that describes the life on this paradisial isle, <clears throat> the southernmost city in the US, surrounded by water, connected by bridges and cultures. But behind that wall, behind the facade, behind the exterior, I'm always surprised. My heavens, I had no idea what was behind us. We somehow tend to believe that we may live all similar lives because of the uh, appurtenances and all the, the baggage we carry with us. We all have electricity and running water, and we have furniture and, and, uh, and such, and closets and uh, chairs. But every home here reflects, of course, the personalities and the temperaments and the interests of the people who have brought their cultures from all around the world. So you see such a rich diversity of not only design and interiors, but because we are so in the world here, as opposed to being walled off like a suburbia or an urban grid, it does give us the sense that here in this island, as perhaps in many islands, but especially in this island, there's always the element of new discovery. Every time I go to a new home, I, oh, I'm always, oh, I didn't know this was here. Yeah. This is beautiful. You know, the, the people's attention that they give to their, their world, they live outdoors. The doors are open, the windows are open. Uh, we live in the world as opposed to shut off from the world. Now, my question then for you is, as you travel all over this world, mountains to lowlands, uh, from uh, desert regions to tropical regions, um, are people's lives really so different no matter where they live? Or does their environment truly define not just how they live because of their clothing or their food, but are people so different, or is it possible that we really are, as we like to believe here, one human family? Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, the, this is uh, that you are, uh, the, the landscape uh, shapes the people, and landscape uh, kind of uh, defines uh, their behavior, and, mm -hmm. and in a large, to a large extent, uh, kind of determines the fate. Uh, like, uh, if you come to Nepal, uh, you see the mountains uh, define the language, mm -hmm. it's so poetic. And so very musical that if, if you if you talk to them, I mean, if you see two people talking, it looks like they're singing, uh, because the landscape in a big way uh, makes makes the people or breaks the people. 
and I, I was like, I was talking to Suzanne. I was there's a friend of mine who came from India, and he was, to, he was we were there, and he was listening to this radio commercial, mm -hmm. uh, which and he said, oh God, what beautiful language you have, and this and that. It's and true. in fact, it was about a, about a diarrhea, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the children have. So it, the, the commercial was telling that uh, you should give salt water and mix it with sugar and give it to the kid if he's suffering from a child, <laughs> a baby. Uh, so the whole I, the, the, the language itself is so musical because of the, the rivers that flow and the rain that comes. And uh, the, the whole whole winds, uh, pass, uh, you know, uh, sh sh shifting through through the landscape. Uh, so of course the landscape will shape uh, uh, shape the yeah. individual. Uh, uh, but at, at the at the root level, we are uh, we are human beings, and we have uh, same blood and uh, same same kind of uh, temper. Uh, but certainly, uh, the people in the mountains or people in in the certain mm -hmm. parts, uh, t uh, they. Uh, the, the the whole tradition also uh, develops and the whole, whole thing that also determines uh, mm -hmm. your fate mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's 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 both ways and it's is uh, is no but certainly landscape i would say uh, mm -hmm. it shapes uh, the destiny of a of a of a yeah your uh, culture your food uh, of course how you live you know uh, whether you you must have uh, heating oil which we do not hear yeah oh uh, yeah thank goodness but what we do have is huge warm hearts oh so when we come back more with my guest today yuyutsu sharma in preview of a presentation tonight at the unitarian universalist church at seven o'clock georgia and petronia street so stay tuned we'll be right back here in the conk broadcasting network the best way to invest in your future is by investing in your education Hodges University offers a bachelor's degree in management right on the Florida Keys Community College campus. This is an accelerated program that can be completed in as little as one year for qualified students. You can earn your degree by attending only one class session per week. Doesn't that sound like a good investment to you? If you already have your bachelor's degree, Hodges University also offers a master's degree in management at FKCC. This program is also in an accelerated format with live classes at Florida Keys. Community College. Hodges also offers 14 degree programs totally online. Now is the perfect time to invest in your future, an investment that will last a lifetime. Call today at 305-295-8881. That's 305-295-8881. Or check out the Hodges website at hodges.edu. Invest in your future with Hodges University. Set your path for a successful business career at Florida Keys Community College. FKCC offers an Associate in Applied Science and Business Administration as well as a new Certificate in Entrepreneurship. Whether you plan to start your own business or enter the private or public sector, FKCC will provide you with essential training that will be useful throughout your business career. Learn more about the opportunities at your community college at fkcc.edu. Fall term begins August 22nd. FKCC, quality education close to home. The Florida Keys Aqueduct Authority has a water supply portfolio that includes fresh water from the Biscayne Aquifer, desalinated brackish water from the Florida Aquifer, water conservation, and reclaimed water from advanced wastewater treatment facilities. We even have seawater desalination available in the event of an emergency. Hurricane season is a great time to review your personal water portfolio. Make sure you have enough drinking water on hand for your family and your pets in the event of an emergency. One gallon per person per day is the minimum recommended amount. Visit FKA.com for more information. Remember, Florida Florida Keys water is precious. Taste it, don't waste. And we're back with Art Waves. I'm your host, Michael Shields, here on the Conk Broadcasting Network. This is Art Waves, where we talk about the arts, its value, its contributions, how it informs, and how it forms our lives. My guest this morning, Yuyutsu Sharma. Recipient of fellowships and grants from Rockefeller Foundation, the Ireland Literature Exchange, the Tribar Foundation, Slovenia, the Institute for the Translation of Hebrew Literature, and the Foundation for the Production and Translation of Dutch Literature. Distinguished poet and translator, author of nine volumes of poetry, is giving a presentation tonight at the Unitarian Universalist Church, 7 o'clock. It's free. You're invited. Folks, you've got to make this. This is certainly going to be... A most memorable occasion, an <clears throat> opportunity for you to hear Yu Yu as we talk about 
his writings. You have given us a glimpse into uh, your world uh, through your writings and uh, the, the theme of traveling and uh, new, uh, how similar we are no matter where we live. Certainly our natural environment helps to shape us and uh, the idea of placemaking and uh, the idea of uh, creating our natural world, being in harmony with, with our natural world is very important. Um, earlier I cited uh, Thoreau's dictum, to know one's mind, one must look to the sky. Is there one place, a refuge, a retreat, a place that you go to for that, to know one's mind? Yeah, I think uh, this every, every person has his own uh, kind of special spot. Uh, mine is Annapurna's. I go there all the time. And with, I think they, uh, they, without that, I would not be uh, a perfect person. I mean, I wouldn't be what I am today. I so, said, yeah, it, it helps in a great uh, deal to, to discover you, like to discover your, uh, let's say, your addiction. Like my tea is my addiction, you know. When you're writing, you, like Hemingway had his own addiction. So I think it's very important for writers and artists to have <coughs> their own addiction. I mean, I wouldn't say they go to, you know, uh, go to other, uh, other things. Mm -hmm. But at least you have a mild kind of uh, thing that you do continuously. So I drink a lot of tea. So first time I came, and I told Susan, I want some tea all the time. <laughs> so, so she had this uh, big, uh, you know, list of all these bags, uh, the tea, tea bags, uh, the whole, whole mm -hmm. array of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, Himalayan and uh, herbal uh, teas. Uh, so I think each writer has kind of obsession, and, uh, mm -hmm. so, so some kind of, uh, you know, uh, fixation. I think that, that also is good uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, also poets have this fixation with life and with the, uh, with, with the whole world, like one of the, Kabir, one of the Sufi poets, uh, Bhakti poets, mm -hmm. he says, "If you want to be a poet, uh, first put your house on fire and come with me, and be a poet." I mean, that de de denounce the world that you live, and then be part of the other world. And other world, you have your other other attractions and other, and also it's, it's formidable job. Not everybody can be a poet or writer. It's, it's it's a difficult job. You have to put your house on fire. You have to forget your own world. Mm -hmm. You have to forget the other world, and then come to the other level of you know consciousness. So, uh, and writing poetry, especially in my part of the world, is more more of a devotional, more mm -hmm. of a mm -hmm. religious kind of. It's not just going to a poetry jam or writing, about getting published in a journal. Mm -hmm. It's it's like poets are revered. They are they're respected. Uh, poets are bigger than any anyone else in the world, uh, but then uh, poetry is taken as uh, uh, you, you don't get paid for poetry. I mean, it's kind of thought as too elevated and uh, thing for a poet to ask for things. So uh, I'm trying to change that. I'm trying to work on it, and so the people can get some. Um, but but poetry uh, has been poets have been the heroes of our uh, our community, mm -hmm. and uh, so the, 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 the uh, Nepal especially is a, is a nation born out of the breath of the poets, mm -hmm. because they, in before uh, like uh, they, they, there was this poet called Bhanubhakta Chare who translated the Ramayana the Hindu scripture into epic into Nepali, and that language is considered the the standard language. It's on basis of that language that the the kings of those times uh, the, they united these scattered principalities and made one nation on the basis of the language. Mm -hmm. So had there not been a language, mm -hmm. Nepal wouldn't exist. So these are the nations born out of the breath of the poets and translators. Mm -hmm. So I was in Slovenia and they were asking, what do you think of Nepalese poetry traditions? I said, everybody is a poet there. Mm -hmm. you know? If you go to, like, it's like Ireland, you go, yeah. you know, everyone is a poet. You, know? it's yeah. like, you yeah. can have world poetry anywhere. Yeah. Uh, so po poetry is vital uh, to, to my part of the world. And, and po poetic, poetic traditions have shaped uh, the destinies of, of these nations. A question for you. You teach at NYU yeah. and elsewhere, I'm sure. But uh, at NYU, the students, you know, here we have 18 to 22, 23-year-olds, maybe a little few years older. Are they any different than uh, our American students, especially at NYU, one of our uh, most esteemed universities? Are they any different than students at other universities around the world that you've taught? Yeah, I, I've been, I mean, I, I was in NYU and I, I mean, I did, I'm the visiting poet this year. So I'm sent to all these disciplines. I was like in Stern School and I was in, mm -hmm. you know, education uh, branch mm -hmm. and I was in creative writing. So I was doing these different, and they are, the students are so good and so, so first rate. And also, and I was in Ottawa and I was teaching at creative mm -hmm. writing uh, school there. And they, um, students, young people get very excited about my work and uh, because they, they like trekking and they like the mountains. Like, in fact, two of the girls 
young girls, it's my students, Alison and uh, Rachel, they came uh, to live with me uh, uh, from uh, Stern School. They came and stayed with me in my house and they became very good friends with my daughter, who's also young, I mean, the mm -hmm. same age. And so mm -hmm. we three of us went to the trekking in the mountains. And so, uh, they, and they are so excited, they want to come back there. Sure. Uh, so students really uh, get excited and they, they are, they're so brilliant and they, they're so very wonderful. And Bayou is a great, uh, great university and it's, it's one of the world's, I think, best uh, you can find mm -hmm. there. And they have been very generous with me, inviting me over and uh, getting uh, all these uh, readings for me. I was reading with Natasha Trekway, a uh, Pulitzer Award winner at, at Lillian, Lily Virian House, the Creative Writing, NYU Creative Writing House. And, and this, this, this has been uh, a great uh, mm -hmm. tour. And ho I hope to uh, you know, continue this in a big way and, and uh, bring, uh, and of course, I, I've been teaching in Nepal, but uh, now the, the teaching creative writing is entirely different. Mm -hmm. Mostly I talk about myself and my world, mm -hmm. you know, and, and students get so glued to it. Mm -hmm. And they, all of them want to come to Nepal, yeah. which is so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what can you tell, uh, say, younger students that young children, they have the gift of music, they have the gift of song, they have the gift of play as they incarnate and they mature. <clears throat> and it seems that many times our very linear educational system seems to crush their spirits rather than elevate them, it seems to repress rather than cultivate their imaginations. And where young children can, because of storytelling and their ear, what they see and what they hear when they're younger, seems much more in tune with the natural world, and then slowly they step away from it <clears throat> to pursue other interests, and our system might be you know, responsible in part for that. But what can you tell a parent with their child? What can they do most to give them that ear and that eye and that open heart for the gift of poetry and story? Yeah, I think uh, I would, uh, I would, my, my world will probably inspire them to travel and uh, go over the world and, and also to seek their own uh, own world and each each uh, what I try to do when I, I talk about my journey my story how I discovered my element how I became a writer so I try to uh, see how, what uh, what they are good at and how how they how their mind works uh, so and, and they will come to me afterwards with some some poems or some some writing or some stories I met this very interesting uh, I was teaching at Sacramento State University I was doing a workshop there and this boy came to me after, he said, would you like to have, uh, I was doing the workshop, and after a while, he said, sir, would you like to have tea? You know, he liked, uh, liked tea. I said, yeah, so he went to Starbucks and got a tea for me. And afterwards, he started talking to me. He said, well, I, I am in America. He was from uh, Mexico, uh -huh. you know, uh, I think from Latin America. Uh -huh. He was born here, mm -hmm. uh, but his father had returned, and he couldn't come back, and he was living with his mother. And uh, he said he is trying to struggle. And I mean, he told his whole story, mm -hmm. how, how it mm -hmm. goes. He was an immigrant and he didn't have any papers and you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And now, uh, after like three years, he wrote back to me. He said, I am, I've been admit admitted. I have got all, all the things. And I've been admitted to a uh, Michigan or some state university. Mm -hmm. And I'm now the, I'm, I am qualified to be everything. And so thanks to you. For, and I'm, I have written my book about my experience. I told him to, to go and deep into your world and write all the experiences of your father coming over, crossing over, and your mother working here. and how you, So it, it worked very well that now this student has got uh, 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 bloomed into a great, uh, a great student and he probably would be a good poet in the years to come. Well, we're going to hear more, I feel, this evening at 7 o'clock at the Unitarian Universalist Church at Georgia and Petronia Streets. I want to thank you very much for being my guest this morning and invite everyone for this wonderful presentation this evening. Stay tuned for more here on Art Waves. I will return on Friday for Film on Friday. Again, I'm your host, Michael Shields, with Yu Yu Tzu Sharma. Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.